Uh, okay, guys, yeah, we are happy to have George Hobbs here from the University of Tennessee. Uh, George uh, finished uh, his PhD in uh, uh, Caltech with uh, uh, Preskill, one of the leaders, current leaders of quantum information, but at that time, he was one of the leaders of string theory. Uh, so it's very interesting to see how uh, he captures the trend that string theorists will go to quantum information slowly. Uh, and uh, now he's a professor in Tennessee and he is uh, this period uh, affiliated with our department through the Nyarkos uh, program of uh, Greek diaspora, um, and we hope to keep this affiliation and collaboration uh, in the following years through various things that we can discuss uh, afterwards informally. So thank you, George. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Tassos. And uh, I also want to thank the uh, Nyarkos uh, Foundation uh, the, for, this, for the support. And uh, I hope uh, we can do something that uh, will benefit uh, both uh, us and uh, uh, the University of Thessaloniki. So I'm going to talk about uh, quantum computing, uh, and uh, not in general. Uh, it's a very, uh, it's a huge subject. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on one flavor of quantum computing that's not uh, as uh, widespread as. Uh, other uh, flavors, uh, uh, and it involves continuous variables. I will explain what that means. And uh, this is the subject that I've uh, uh, concentrated mostly on uh, during the last few years. Here's an outline uh, of what I'm going to talk about. And uh, please interrupt me whenever you uh, uh, you want to uh, you want me to uh, explain something further, or you have questions, or even if a question is not uh, directly related to what I'm saying. But because I, I don't know uh, if, if people are uh, familiar with uh, any of these subjects that I'm going to talk about. So if you uh, if you don't understand something, just uh, speak up. Uh, I, I'm going to start with uh, uh, talking about gates. Uh, gates meaning um, when you have a quantum, uh, not a quantum, but a, any computation that you want to do on a, on a quantum computer or on, on a computer. Sorry, uh, then you have to have uh, gates that uh, will uh, carry the uh, the logical uh, steps. And in this case, it would be quantum gates. And uh, I'm going to talk about this flavor of uh, continuous variables, which require what we call in general uh, Gaussian gates, uh, and uh, and then we need at least one uh, non-Gaussian gates, as I will explain. So that will be the first thing I will talk about. Then I will talk about uh, quantum field theory, uh, because uh, th this is uh, one uh, interesting application uh, of uh, this uh, framework. Uh, another interesting application is uh, quantum machine learning. Uh, that's something, well, machine learning is something that people all kinds of people are interested in these days. And quantum machine learning is supposed to provide uh, uh, advantages over uh, classical ma machine learning. All that is will be possible only if we could do error correction, because there are a lot of errors when you uh, want to do a, a quantum computation. Of course, when you do classical computation, there are a lot of errors as well, but most of them are uh, very well understood, and that's why we can do all kinds of computations with uh, our current computers. But in this case, it's actually uh, a very uh, it's an open subject because uh, we don't really know much about it. So I'll explain a little bit of that uh, at the end. So a little bit of uh, motivation. Uh, as you know, uh, quantum fields are uh, the fundamental constituents of uh, our world. Everything that uh, has to do with nature is described by uh, a quantum field. And uh, I mean, anything that uh, ranges from many body systems uh, all, all the way to uh, what we are interested in, us being a high energy physicist uh, at the uh, 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 at the fundamental level uh, of, uh, of uh, where we want to understand the interactions of, uh, of nature. We have uh, electromagnetic and gravitational radiation uh, now. And uh, this is the theoretical uh, 
motivation, but uh, recently uh, people figured out that uh, you can use uh, quantum field uh, kind of engineering to do much more than we could do before. And, and this actually gave, uh, uh, has a, had a very important result, which was uh, uh, they used the quantum state of light to lower uh, the noise floor uh, for the uh, uh, for the LIGO uh, observatory uh, below the, what we call the shot limit so that they were able to observe uh, gravitational waves. That was a huge achievement. Uh, and it took uh, many, many years uh, for people to, uh, to be able to, uh, to do that. And it was made possible because we uh, harnessed the quantum nature of light, which is of course a quantum field. Then, uh, so when we uh, encode uh, quantum information in general, uh, and uh, if you're interested in quantum computation in particular, that's part of uh, the more general umbrella of uh, quantum information. We are gonna uh, encode that in continuous variables, which means we're gonna encode them in fields. The fields uh, in general have infinite dimensions. So you can think of them mostly as a, as a collection of harmonic oscillators, uh, each uh, uh, having an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And in that case, we talk about the Q modes in, in this context, as opposed to qubits, which is a more uh, general, uh, 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 a more generally accepted term because uh, most people these days build quantum computers that uh, rely on qubits, which only have, uh, uh, a, a finite uh, Hilbert space. It's mostly a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And people have shown already uh, that we have a lot of experimental results that, that uh, actually uh, demonstrate entanglement of uh, Q modes. Uh, 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 I mean, millions of Q modes, and, and, and that's a, a huge achievement. So it looks very promising that, that uh, at some point we're going to be able to build a, a quantum computer that's based on what I'm, I will keep calling Q modes. And uh, so uh, it, it gives a different uh, architecture than, than qubits. It, it requires different kinds of uh, operations and different uh, theoretical uh, understanding of uh, what's going on, but it has applications uh, both in uh, quantum computing as well as quantum communications, actually also uh, quantum sensing. Uh, and all those uh, uh, different uh, areas uh, have been shown to have advantages over uh, the classical methods. Now, if we uh, want to uh, eventually replace our current uh, or at least uh, have devices that are uh, at the, sa uh, the same, uh, uh, uses uh, our current devices, we have to uh, be able to create uh, integrated devices at, at the nanoscale. And uh, people have already uh, started doing that with uh, Q modes and uh, we, uh, uh, it, 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 within the next uh, few years, it may be possible to surpass uh, the performance of uh, qubit based uh, devices. We're not there yet. Of course, the qubit devices as well have problems because they're very uh, noisy at this point. There are different ways to implement uh, this Q mode, uh, and probably the uh, the best way is using light. You don't have to use light. You can use any field uh, that uh, you can uh, control, but light is the easiest thing to control. So it's a very promising implementation of uh, Q modes. And people have been using it in uh, sensing and uh, communication. So if we manage to create a, a chip, let's say a, ch a small chip uh, with uh, integrated uh, optics, uh, we should be able to uh, one day uh, have a large scale uh, and fault tolerant quantum computing. The advantage of this kind of quantum computing over uh, more standard methods that require that use qubits is that they can all operate at room temperature. And uh, at room temperature, uh, we won't need those huge uh, refrigerators that people use for uh, the current uh, quantum computers that uh, uh, are based on qubits. So that's a big advantage. And uh, um, it will be uh, interesting to see 
whether we can uh, develop those uh, devices based on Q-modes uh, to the point where we can do uh, uh, significant uh, computations. Are there any questions at this point? Uh, I'll just continue. Okay, so I'm gonna get a little more uh, uh, technical here. Um, we want to do quantum computation using Q modes. And by that, we mean uh, we want to create all the different gates that we need for any computation, any possible computation. So we want to have a universal set. So you have a, a and you can ask what is the minimal set I need to be able to implement on a machine that will be able to, to uh, implement all uh, possible computations that uh, I would be interested in. The easiest thing to implement, any, uh, uh, any such operation will be a unitary, uh, and a unitary will be e to the i sum operator, which will be Hermitian. And in our case, because we're doing Q modes, we have, if you think of them as harmonic oscillators, let's say you have only one mode, then the one mode, uh, you think of it as a harmonic oscillator, it will have a, a P and a Q, right? And we will obey the usual uh, commutation relations. The, uh, uh, the simplest, so any gate will be for, uh, any gate will be E to the I, some operator, which is Hermitian. And if that operator is quadratic in those uh, uh, in the P and Q, which I will call quadrature for uh, if thinking that I'm implementing uh, some uh, electromagnetic field, uh, then uh, it's easy to implement those. Uh, it's possible with uh, uh, optical elements to implement uh, uh, those uh, uh, Gaussian uh, uh, operators. Okay, so you have those unitary Gaussians whose exponent is a quadratic expression in P and Q. But these are not enough to, pre to Im uh, implement the uh, uh, universal quantum computation. You need at least one more gate. And that one more gate can be anything, anything that's not Gaussian. So you only need to implement that one gate. But that's very hard. And so, in general, you, you, can, you can think of that one extra gate as uh, uh, some uh, phase gate, which uh, will be a, a polynomial here in the quadrature Q. And the polynomial can be uh, uh, of uh, degree n, where n is greater than or equal to 3. In the simplest case, it will just be uh, what we call a cubic gate. A cubic, because it will be Q uh, with the power 3. Okay, so we need to, uh, to, to find that gate to implement if we want uh, to have a, a universal uh, quantum computation based on those uh, Q modes. So how can we do that? Here's one uh, uh, idea. We can expand or uh, we can approximate that uh, exponential by writing it as uh, the usual one plus I over N times this polynomial, all raised to the power n, where n is a large number. And as n goes to infinity, this uh, approximation becomes exact. Each uh, factor here is a polynomial of degree little n, just like p sub n. And I can expand that, uh, not expand, but I can factor this polynomial into n factors. Each one I will call u. Each one will be uh, a linear uh, function of Q. Okay, so uh, minus one over gamma will be the, uh, uh, the, uh, the zero of the polynomial. All right, so if I do that, then all I have to do is implement one of those linear uh, polynomials. Right. So how do I do that? So here's a way to implement those uh, polynomials without uh, uh, introducing anything uh, strange, uh, by strange, uh, anything uh, hard uh, uh, to implement, or anything beyond uh, uh, simple optical elements. I will start with a state psi, which I can write uh, in terms of uh, psi of q, uh, wave function, a uh, function of q. And then I will uh, uh, prepare a coherent state. 
a weak coherent state, although that's not necessarily, uh, that's not absolutely necessary, but let's say you have a, a, an additional weak coherent state that we call alpha, where D is this uh, uh, linear, uh, uh, it's, it's a displacement operator, okay? Then I will uh, interact our state uh, with this coherent state. So I will take this uh, uh, state that I'm interested in and interact with this uh, uh, coherent state through a two-mode operator. And because it's a two-mode operator, it's a, it's a Gaussian. So I don't have to do anything uh, extra apart from implementing uh, a Gaussian operator. Although it's not so easy to implement that operator, but, but it is possible uh, to implement uh, any Gauss. Once I implement this uh, unitary, I arrive at this state here, which is in a tensor product of the two uh, Hilbert spaces, right? One is for the arbitrary state psi, and the other one is for the uh, coherent state. So I will get this kind of uh, uh, entangled state, which, uh, uh, if you do the, uh, the math, it's pretty simple. You, uh, it's given by this uh, expression here. And now let me show two different methods of uh, uh, moving forward. One is theoretically simple, but it is very challenging experimental. And that's if I uh, apply this projection operator onto the states which are not the ground state. We can do that theoretically very easily, but it's very hard uh, experimentally. Then the, uh, uh, you get a state, and it's easy to see, if, it's a, if you start with this coherent, a weak coherent state, all the, uh, the terms in the series uh, become uh, small. So the dominant part will be the, just this alpha times this u uh, uh, acting on the state one, one being the state in the harmonic oscillator. Uh, the number uh, eigenstate, okay? And then uh, the, uh, uh, so you, you have a small error in this case, but you end up with this uh, uh, state here, which is actually what you want. The, uh, the coherent state has now decoupled and you get the, uh, the state that you start with, remember it was just psi, but now you have multiplied by this U, which is uh, this linear uh, operator. So we managed to do that, but we did something that is not possible experiment. So what can we do to, uh, to improve so that uh, we can actually do it experimentally? So here is another uh, way of doing it, uh, but it's, it's, it's more uh, involved, but it is uh, experimentally more feasible. And um, I think, uh, actually I'm not watching the time, but... Uh, I think I'm going to skip all the details here, but uh, and if you want, uh, I'll, you can look at the slide later and see, uh, or you can read our paper uh, and see how uh, this is done. At the end, you get uh, a state, which is uh, 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 again, what you want, uh, but this state you get by repeating uh, the, uh, this, uh, this process that described here uh, as many times as needed for, for uh, for the uh, uh, auxiliary state to be uh, uh, to go into the state zero. So so in this case, uh, uh, you, we end up with uh, uh, with a state that we want, and uh, the whole process is experimentally feasible. It's feasible up to a point though, because uh, you have to check every time whether that state is zero or one, and that's not hard. You can put a detector which state, which can tell you whether that state is zero or one. It's zero if the detector doesn't click and it's one if it clicks. But uh, once you, the detector clicks, uh, you have to uh, uh, stop the process. And, and that's an if statement. And it's not easy to implement an if statement uh, if, uh, because it's a classical, uh, uh, statement, right? So you, you have to have uh, the outcome from the quantum process to, uh, to uh, process a, 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 a classical if statement, and that's not easy. So within that, uh, 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 that we, 
bearing that issue, the, the, it, it's possible uh, experimentally. This is called uh, uh, subtracting a photon because uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, you subtract the photon from your uh, uh, coherent state. And uh, if P is the probability of subtracting that photon, little p the probability, then you, it takes uh, uh, about one over P steps uh, each time. Of course, there are uh, problems that, that you uh, have to address and, and that has to do with the, uh, your device. For example, there are detector imperfections. Your detector has to be perfect if you want to achieve uh, uh, no, uh, uh, a result that uh, is, uh, doesn't have any errors. But you never have a, a perfect detector. You always have an efficiency, uh, uh, which is less than one. And in that case, uh, you're going to get, you're going to introduce an error by going through this. So that error has to be small enough for your, uh, for your problem to be, uh, to, to get the result that uh, w is within, uh, uh, within, within your uh, uh, tolerance. Okay. The other thing is a dark cow. That actually, uh, with the, the new detectors, uh, th that's much improved, uh, but uh, you always have to be careful whether uh, you don't see a click because of the dark uh, uh, count uh, in the detector. So all these uh, experimental things you have to uh, worry about when you build a, a, an algorithm that, uh, uh, that solves a, a theoretical problem. Uh, and uh, with a, a classical computer, you don't have to do that because there were a lot of people before you that actually took care of all these problems. But in this case, we're not there yet. What we, I mean, the, the main thing we need to uh, concentrate on is uh, to get rid of all, all those errors so that uh, the future, in the future, we can do uh, computations that are uh, useful and uh, uh, error free. There are other uh, proposals for uh, cubic gates, uh, and uh, they're interesting, and people have been trying to implement them. Uh, one is this uh, so-called GKP scheme. And uh, so in, in, in that case, uh, uh, it, it involves uh, a large shift in momentum, you know, squeezing, which is always uh, hard. Uh, and, uh, and there are problems in this case just like with any other implementation. Uh, in, in this case, you need large squeezing and uh, large and squeezing is hard, even though it's a Gaussian operation, it's not so easy to implement experimentally. And uh, the amount of squeezing that you need uh, for this uh, gate is uh, not possible with current technology. Although people are, are really trying uh, to bring the uh, squeezing requirement uh, uh, lower. There's another scheme by uh, the MFF scheme. Uh, you apply, it's similar to what I described, except that in this case, you need the three photon subtraction. And that's much harder because the, the probability of success becomes one over P cubed, which is much, much smaller. So imagine having to do this many, many times uh, during your algorithm, uh, then it becomes, uh, uh, it's not useful anymore. So let me uh, continue with uh, an application, uh, something that uh, most of us, uh, or probably all of us are familiar with, uh, the uh, scalar field theory, which is the simplest thing you can apply. So here I imagine a, a scalar field theory, let's say phi to the fourth, and uh, I put the system on a lattice. It's one dimensional, you can do more dimensions if you want but it's uh, easier to describe if it's one dimension. I set the, uh, uh, the lattice spacing A to equal to one, just to make things uh, simple to, uh, to talk about. So X is now an integer, X is the special dimension. So in this case, I put the system on a lattice only in space, not in time, because time is gonna be, uh, is, is gonna be continuous since I'm uh, simulating the system with a quantum system, uh, I don't have to discretize time. So that's a, uh, an advantage here. So uh, I will be talking about the Hamiltonian. And then if I want to talk about physical processes, I will be talking about the evolution operator, but T in that case would be a continuous variable. 
So the free Hamiltonian is given by uh, this expression. If you don't have any interactions, you have a quadratic expression in phi and uh, pi, which is the conjugate momentum to phi. You can uh, summarize this uh, in, a, in a matrix form. Uh, okay? And you have this matrix V, uh, whose eigenvalues and eigenvectors are well known. You have this uh, uh, eigenvalue, which is uh, this expression here. I'm, I'm sure everybody's familiar with. And the corresponding eigenvectors are given by uh, these expressions. Okay? You start with the, uh, an initial state uh, if you want to depending on what kind of problem uh, you want. For example, if you want to figure out the uh, different eigenstates of, of the Hamiltonian, of course, not the free Hamiltonian because uh, we already know the, uh, the states, but if you want to figure out any uh, state in your system, let's say you start with, uh, 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 I'm gonna define creation and annihilation operators for phi and pi. So for each point on my lattice, I will uh, define a creation and annihilation operators. And then I can easily define the ground state by annihilating it with all the annihilation operators. Okay? But that's not what we're interested in. This is not a physical state. This is uh, just a convenient definition of a state, but it's not the ground state of the system, right? Because I have to diagonalize the Hamiltonian to figure out the ground state of the system. So that's why uh, the, uh, the actual annihilation operator that we normally define is given by this more complicated expression, which involves all the different phi's, the phi's at all the different points on the lattice. And these also obey the standard commutation relations between uh, creation and annihilation operators, and they diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So you can see that all the eigenvalues of that Hamiltonian are the standard uh, omega sub k. For this Hamiltonian, there is a ground state, which I will call omega to distinguish it from the zero state here. And that state will be annihilated by all the annihilation operators. Uh, Little oh, yeah. just, just a second, there is no uh, vacuum energy here. Well, I mean, you can always normal order. Uh... I mean, it, it depends how you want to define H. So you want to define it uh, normal ordered or not. If you don't define as normal order, then you're gonna uh, have a ground state energy. Okay. Well, it's just a matter of uh, how you want to define things. Okay, thanks. Right, I mean, it, it it's not gonna affect any physical results unless you include gravity. Okay, which I'm not gonna do. All right, so uh, ground state uh, here, the ground state of, the, of your system is defined uh, by annihilating with this little a's, okay? But the convenient thing to do is to define the capital A's. So how do we, def how do we create this state uh, experimentally, okay? So experimentally, uh, we can create it by noticing that there is a, a unitary transformation that takes us from the little a's to the capital A's. And that transformation involves a unitary operator, which is a Gaussian uh, unitary. So we don't really need all the stuff that I described before. We just need to implement Gaussian operators. And then I can create the ground state omega that I'm interested in just by acting with this U dagger on uh, the ground state zero that's uh, native to the system, to the experimental system. Okay, and then uh, uh, for the excited states, I can do the same thing. Uh, the A dagger acting on zero is the native state defined for the harmonic oscillator that's in my experiment. I can go to the uh, harmonic oscillator state that I'm interested in because I'm interested in this uh, quantum field theory by acting with uh, this unitary operator, the same unitary operator. And I can define any other state like that, any state involving any number of particles. Okay. So that's simple, but this is a free theory. So we're not done yet. Of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the physical quantities, the physical states will be uh, wave packets. So I have to uh, 
multiply by some uh, function f, function of the wave vector or, or space, uh, depending on how you define it. And then some of it where f uh, is strongly peaked at some momentum. Okay? It's not going to be a delta function. Well, there's not a delta function here, but it's a, a delta function. The continuum is going to be is going to have some width, and that's the state that uh, has finite norm. So that's the state that uh, I, I want to create. But I can do that by doing uh, uh, this kind of superposition. And if I want more particles to, to include more particles, I will do the same thing and repeat it as many times as needed. Now, if I introduce in, uh, interactions, let's say I introduce this uh, simple interaction, the phi to the fourth, I will add the, this part of the Hamiltonian. And I will also add a, a counter term. This is delta uh, sub m, uh, right? To, uh, to uh, get rid of uh, infinities. And when I do uh, uh, the time evolution of my system, I will do uh, successive unitaries of, uh, that involve the free Hamiltonian and the, uh, uh, this new, this interaction piece, including the counter term. The, uh, this, uh, indirect, this uh, original Hamiltonian, H0, the free Hamiltonian is a Gaussian. So that's easy to implement. And so is the counter term because the counter term is, is quadratic in phi. But the interaction piece, the phi to the fourth, is not uh, a Gaussian. So that's the thing that I need to create. That's the additional uh, uh, thing that I need to create. And, and that I can create by. Uh, doing what I said before by writing each factor that you see here like this, uh, which is a, a quartic uh, a gate, I can split it into uh, a product of, uh, uh, I guess it's not monomials, but linear uh, polynomials that uh, each of which I can uh, implement the, the way I, I described before. Or you can do it a different way. If you have some, uh, some other experimental system that uh, can do it in a different way, that's fine as well. But this is the, uh, uh, the difficult part in, in this whole uh, game. And at the end, the, if, if I uh, do a scattering experiment, I will want to measure, I want to create the final state and then measure uh, uh, the photon number of, of that state, the photon number in different uh, modes. And that's easy because uh, uh, the, uh, the final state, uh, I by measuring, I mean, I will project onto this kind of state. And this kind of state I can get from, uh, from the states that uh, where I have the uh, capital A's, A daggers acting on the ground state, which are uh, uh, native to the uh, experiment by acting uh, with this, uh, the same unitary uh, op uh, uh, operator, which is a Gaussian. So in kind of uh, I will uncompute in order to project onto the uh, to those states. So um, so here here's a different. Uh, 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 I mean, I, I talked about the uh, the simplest case, the scalar field theory. So here's a, a more realistic case of a scalar quantum electrodynamics. And uh, so here I have uh, three dimensions, which is uh, more, more realistic. And uh, apart from the, uh, uh, the scalar field, I, I now have two massive scalar fields because of the same mass, because uh, I want to give them a charge and I will add uh, photons. So that's a, an additional uh, field. I can do the same thing I did before, except uh, more times, because now I have more fields, uh, but it works more or less the same way. So I'm not gonna go through all the details. And uh, at the end, I, I diagonalize the Hamiltonian in the standard way. And again, it works the same way, except uh, uh, more, uh, a little more complicated, but uh, the, the, the addition, the, the new, uh, Part of the Hamiltonian is the uh, uh, QED part, where I have the uh, electric uh, magnetic fields. 
And in addition uh, to this standard uh, Lagrangian that I would write, uh, I will add uh, uh, this uh, term here uh, to implement uh, uh, gauge fixing. Okay, so, so you go through uh, uh, this, uh, going from Lagrangian to Hamiltonian, you get this Hamiltonian here, and uh, uh, you, you end up imposing Gauss's law, which in this case is uh, the, uh, the divergence of the electric field equal to zero. I write the, the electric field like this because it's uh, the, the variable uh, or the field conjugate to the, uh, the vector potential. Anyway, I don't want to bore you with all uh, the details, but the, uh, the photon part works the same way. The only difference uh, or the only additional complication being Gauss's law. You have to implement Gauss's law on each state. So you have to make sure that whatever uh, your process or your quantum computation does, it keeps obeying uh, Gauss's law. It turns out that in this case, it's actually possible to do that by starting with a, a transverse state like this, for example, where you have uh, uh, zeta being the polarization being uh, uh, perpendicular to the momentum. You, uh, uh, if, if you make sure that uh, you, you have a state that, uh, that's transverse uh, at the beginning, uh, you can slowly turn on the interaction or the charge and uh, that, uh, so in this case, uh, you, you can make sure that Gauss's law is obeyed. It will be interesting to do this in uh, more complicated cases uh, and see if uh, uh, this uh, same uh, or similar uh, process works. And it's not easy, especially if you do a non-abelian uh, gauge theory. Anyway, so I'll, I'll skip uh, all, all the details here and uh, it, it works in a similar way, uh, apart from this uh, uh, implementation of Gauss's law. All right, let's uh, uh, go to something a little different. Uh, that's uh, quantum machine learning. I don't know how much you know about uh, machine learning. And there are various uh, algorithms that are uh, very uh, basic uh, tools for machine learning. And I, I just want to mention a, a couple of them where, and, and go through them, uh, see uh, how you can do a quantum computation uh, for, for these tools. For example, you have matrix inversion, uh, what people call principal component analysis and the vector distance. So, the, uh, so let's say you have a, a bunch of data, classical data, you have to encode those classical data in quantum states. And that's usually hard because, uh, well, first of all, how are you gonna encode something? Uh, you have to translate something classical to, uh, to a quantum state. Let's say you achieve that. Then how are you gonna store uh, the data? Uh, we can easily store data. We have a hard drive, right? And you store data very easily. But if you want to store uh, quantum data, we really don't have a good way of doing that. But let's say we do have that. Then uh, we need to be able to access the data. And that's also hard. Uh, in uh, uh, standard computers, we have RAM, right? And access is uh, data very efficiently. So here we need to create QRAM. And it can be very, very efficient if we can somehow manage to uh, do this experimentally. And experiment, so even though theoretically we can see a lot of advantages over uh, classical computers, experimentally again, it's a challenge. So theories actually work uh, hand in hand with experimentalists in this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, tasks. So here it gets a little uh, technical. I, I don't know if you want to see all uh, the details, but there is a, a, a way to um, I, I, I don't want to uh, bore you with all the details. Let me mention a couple of things that are uh, interesting. For example, if I have a, a state, I usually think of a state as a row, which is a density matrix, but uh, it can also be a pure state. If rho is, uh, let's say, uh, 
uh, cat psi times bra psi, uh, where psi is a, a pure state, then uh, to rho represents a pure state. If I want to, uh, to figure out the eigenvalues of, of an operator, which is uh, one of the basic things you need to do when you do uh, uh, machine learning, then I, I, I need to implement, or one way to do that is to implement uh, an exponential whose exponent is this density matrix rho. That density matrix rho is, uh, is a Hermitian operator, right? If it's a Hermitian operator, it can be Hamiltonian. And if it's a Hamiltonian, can you actually create a system that uh, will uh, uh, produce uh, this e to the i t times the Hamiltonian, which is an evolution operator? So you should be able to experimentally create this kind of uh, exponential. But it's not easy because uh, rho represents a system that is a quantum system. How do you act with that quantum system on another system? <laughs> Even though uh, that, that system is represented by rho, which is, can be thought of as a Hamiltonian theoretically, how do you actually do that experimentally? So Lloyd and, uh, uh, and collaborators uh, came up with a very clever way to do that and uh, by using the, uh, the swap operator. And the swap operator swaps two different states. That's not hard to implement. And then they, they showed that it's possible uh, to, uh, to use this operator to implement a, a unitary operator, a, a, a unitary evolution operator whose Hamiltonian is actually a physical system. Uh, uh, that was one of the, uh, the brilliant things that they've done. So in our case, if we want to do this with uh, continuous variables, we have to be able to implement uh, operators that look like this, for example. Uh, where you have the A dagger A, which represents the Hamiltonian of, of a harmonic oscillator, and then the C dagger C, which represents the, harmonic, uh, the Hamiltonian of a different harmonic oscillator. How can I implement uh, an evolution operator where the Hamiltonian is a product of the two Hamiltonians? That's something you don't normally think about uh, in any physical context, but in this case, you have to think about it if you want to do quantum computation. And the way you do that is by changing uh, or, or transforming this uh, operator back to a quartic gate or, and the quartic gate will, be, will involve only one mode. So it will involve only one of those Hamiltonians and that's possible to do actually. Uh, here I have an expression that actually does that. Uh, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but at the end, and it's just a, a algebra, standard algebra that uh, you can follow uh, at home if you want. But uh, at the end, you end up with uh, two quartic gates that you see here, or actually uh, three, four uh, quartic gates, each of which uh, involves a single mode. And we know, or I told you how to implement those. Okay, so uh, you may say, well, you have to do all this work just to do something that uh, conceptually is pretty simple, which is just to do a swap. A swap, actually a conditional swap, which means you do a swap uh, on condition that something else has a certain value. But that's uh, uh, important in order to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, figure out the eigenvalues of, uh, of a matrix. One of the essential uh, operations uh, for uh, uh, machine learning. So, uh, Jorgo, just uh, uh, an idea, I don't know if that we have thought about it. So this, if you do this kind of swapping in, uh, electromagnetism that would be related to electric magnetic duality somehow? No, no, it won't be. Uh, this is uh, swapping between uh, states. 
two different states. So you have to, two different physical systems. Each system comes with a state. Yes. And then you don't swap the systems, you swap their states. Yes, so I'm, I'm thinking if you have you know, an electric and a magnetic state, that's what I'm... Well, yeah, I mean, what does that mean? So uh, the electric field is, a, is, is an operator. Yeah, so you can so have a state, paper, state you have would electric be... fields, electric charges, and uh, another, another system where you, the states are magnetic charges. That's what I mean. And well, yeah, but uh, the system is described by the same Hamiltonian, OK? So you have two different states of a Hamiltonian. Let's say you have a, a single photon state and a two photon state. Yeah. For example. And then you swap them. You don't swap the, uh, the physical system, you swap their states. Yes, that would be like if you have the same physical system and a state has one electron or one monopole. And you swap. Uh, right, but the monopole doesn't exist. Well, yes. Again, All right. So, uh, but, but you, you're thinking of a, a, a state that belongs to a different Hamiltonian. Here, we're talking about uh, two states of the same Hamiltonian, the same system. So, let's say you have QED. Okay, so you have a, a, a two fermion, let's say you have two fermion system and another. Uh, and particle antiparticle system. No, it's, it's but it's the same uh, in uh, in uh, uh, in many uh, systems. Uh, you have uh, for the same system, you have a phase where you have electric charges and a phase where you have magnetic charges. It's the same system. So, yeah, okay, so if you have that uh, that kind of Hamiltonian that encompasses both, then yes, you can have that. Yeah, but, uh, that's, that's, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So I don't know if, I don't know if it's useful or, uh, I don't know if this uh, helps in, in, in any way with. Uh, I mean, uh, this, this swapping, it reminds me of what sometimes people call duality between, uh, Two different. Uh, yeah, but duality means that uh, you actually take one state and you transform it until it becomes the other state. I mean, here you can argue that it's the same or similar thing because uh, you're transforming it until it becomes the other state, but but you're actually uh, stealing the other state from somewhere somewhere else to bring it uh, to yeah. yourself. So I, I don't know. I don't know if. Uh, it, it, it might be interesting, it might be not. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so once, uh, uh, so one way to, uh, to see the uh, why this is useful is if I want to invert a matrix, and here's a very simple example where you have a matrix uh, acting on the vector y and gives you b, I want to find y. And the, y is the a inverse times b. So how do you find that? Uh, you, you can do, you can go through these steps that I'm showing here and uh, you get, uh, uh, and those steps involve what I said before, uh, because you're gonna have to apply this operator here, which is quadratic uh, in, so you have P1 and P2 in quadratic, but then you have A, which is this uh, matrix here. And that, if that matrix is Hermitian, I can think of it as a Hamiltonian. And then I have, uh, or you can think of this as uh, two uh, different Hamiltonians. You take a product just like before. So it involves the same kind of uh, uh, procedure to, uh, to uh, implement this uh, uh, operator. And at the end, if you, uh, you get a state, uh, uh, which is actually the A inverse acting on, on your vector. But the vector now is a state, and the A inverse is uh, encoded uh, in, in the coefficients. All right, so uh, so that's one uh, 
one case. Uh, there are other cases. Um, I don't know how much you want me to talk for. But, uh, uh, we have the principal uh, component analysis. Uh, it's kind of similar. I, I don't want to go through in detail. Vector distance. Uh, you, you want to find the distance between two vectors. So you want to create, uh, to do a quantum computation that will give you that, uh, uh, that distance. Uh, it involves, once again, uh, swapping. Uh, so swapping again involves uh, uh, quartic vertices. So, so these quartic vertices actually work for uh, all, all the different tasks you want to do for, uh, uh, for uh, machine learning. All right. Uh, let me say a little bit about the quantum error correction, and then I, I will stop. Uh, quantum error correction uh, is uh, actually not uh, very advanced uh, for uh, Q modes. Well, it's not very advanced for uh, for qubits either, but uh, at least in that case, uh, we know a lot more, except that uh, uh, we now have uh, devices that are not uh, uh, very good, uh, and so uh, we need to actually, uh, so in that case, you can argue the same thing that the, uh, we need to develop uh, error correction codes for the devices we actually have, not the devices that uh, we're going to have hopefully in a few years. In this case, uh, so we, we have to think about, uh, uh, you have uh, Gaussian elements and non-Gaussian elements that you need to correct because uh, the system always interacts with the environment and that's what creates uh, all these errors. So you have uh, Gaussian errors, non-Gaussian errors, uh, and, uh, and, and then uh, th there are practical things like uh, you cannot create a state. For example, uh, in uh, quantum mechanics, we always talk about the eigenstates of position or, or momentum, but these are not normalizable states. So uh, you cannot create them in uh, nature. You have to create something that approximates them. And those are uh, what we call the squeeze states. So instead of having a delta function state, you have some uh, Gaussian which, with a short uh, width. And those create uh, additional errors. So you have to figure out uh, uh, your tolerance, how, how much tolerance, how much uh, squeezing is enough for your uh, for your algorithm, whatever you want to do, and there are other uh, there are solutions uh, uh, to these problems. Uh, uh, one is to uh, uh, out of all this uh, infinite space, uh, which is the, the space of a harmonic oscillator, you choose two states uh, to represent your uh, computation, and then those two states, if you choose them uh, uh, wisely, uh, you can uh, they will be uh, resistant to errors and so on. So there are different uh, things uh, that you can do. Cat states is one thing that people have been uh, uh, thinking about. And uh, a cat, you have the coherent states, which are easy to create. And then if you take the superposition of two uh, uh, coherent states, uh, you can create a, a, what we call a two-legged cat. Uh, or you can take a, a superposition of uh, a cat because of Schrodinger, because uh, uh, these are hard states to, to create. And, uh, uh, and, and then if you just, uh, 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 if you just stick to uh, uh, two, two of those cat states, let's say with, uh, uh, with parameters, uh, let's say beta and minus beta, then you can create a two-dimensional Hilbert space. There's a little problem that uh, these two states are not orthogonal, so they're not like uh, up and down with spin. But if uh, beta is large, uh, the, uh, the overlap, the inner product between those two states is actually very, very small, exponentially small. So it is uh, practical uh, to do this kind of uh, definition and create uh, uh, Hebrew spaces that are finite with uh, uh, states that you can actually create easily uh, experimentally. Or you can um, do uh, more complicated things, uh, two-legged cat. Uh, because they uh, they're even more protected. The more uh, legs you put on a cat, the the uh, the, the better the uh, the protection against errors. All right. So I think I'll uh, conclude the uh, 
there are various uh, advantages, experimental advantages, uh, in using uh, Q modes as opposed, especially those realized by uh, uh, photons, because we're we're very uh, we have a lot of sophisticated methods dealing with uh, light. So it's it'll be. Uh, I think that there are a lot of advantages in using those systems uh, for quantum information uh, processing. Uh, there's still uh, the issue of uh, how you create uh, a non-Gaussian gate. You, as, uh, and as I said, you only need one, but that one is actually uh, challenging. There are various proposals, but uh, they all have their uh, difficulties. And uh, for with uh, current technologies, uh, we can actually do all these things. Uh, it's just that uh, we have to have a better control of uh, the system in order to create a, a useful uh, quantum computer. I think I'll stop here and thank you so much uh, for uh, paying attention. Thank you. So, uh... Are there questions from anyone that would like to ask something? Uh, yes, I do have some questions. Let me turn my camera on. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, George, for a very illuminating seminar. Uh, what I wanted to ask, I mean, the first question involves time. Uh, do, do you have any idea about how much time will be gained if this new uh, technology is applied? For instance, if you want to invert a matrix, if I remember well, the time factor goes like n square. Yeah. How fast this algorithm will be? Well, I mean, that depends on how fast uh, each elementary operation is uh, implemented, right? So I think uh, any operation uh, has to be less than, uh, or we can make it be less than a second. Now, a second is a very long time in, in this game. Usually we want less than a millisecond, but that's the order of uh, uh, time. That's the time scale we're uh, looking at with, with these, uh, uh, all these operations. Now, if if uh, uh, you have an algorithm that uh, that has a large n, uh, then uh, that means that you're probably not going to be able to to implement yeah, it. Some impractical problem. But it will be it will be very uh, impractical. Yeah. Inversion of matrices, something like uh, five thousand. Uh, yeah. Five hundred thousand by five hundred thousand. Uh, right. On the other hand, uh, people have created uh, modes uh, that are in the millions. So it's pretty sophisticated. It, it's not trivial. Uh, is it useful? I would say not yet. But uh, I think that uh, we're going to find useful applications uh, soon. But these algorithms will be most certainly very fast. I mean, for uh, they will be very uh, fast. Uh, but uh, what's more important, I think, is that uh, they, they will uh, they can handle a, a lot of complexity, much more than uh, any classical machine. Okay. We're yeah. not there yet uh, because uh, you to need to uh, yeah. well. It's, uh, it's early in the sense that uh, we really need to find a more efficient way of implementing this one gate, one gate that uh, is not Gauss. Uh, well, I have a couple of questions which are, are, are more or less field theory related. At the first example, where you introduced the mass counter term. Yeah. Uh, what about other counter terms. I mean, for instance, uh, state uh, uh, wave function normalization, in other words, uh, don't well, you well, modify the creation and annihilation operators? Uh, no. Uh... Or normalize them. 
No, the uh, so in, this was a very simple case where you have one, you have two parameters that define your system, uh, right? Lambda and M. Now, what you're saying will affect the physical lambda and the physical M. Yes. Yes. So the uh, the way you uh, so so you so if you follow uh, if, if you just put that counter term there, then you're gonna get uh, uh, let's say a green function. You, you calculate a green function, and you try to find the pole. That pole will tell you what your lambda, the physical lambda, is. Okay. okay. So uh, if yeah. you want the specific physical lambda then you have to try different original lambdas in your Hamiltonian to end up with that lambda. You don't have to change anything. Yes, but your okay. green function will uh, contain constant on top of it instead of being one. If you have right, a, so you, you have to... But that won't change much, just... Uh, well, so... so uh, So, so let me put it in a similar way. So you, you only have two parameters, okay? And, okay? and your theory is defined by those two parameters. How your physical parameters are related to those has to do with what uh, uh, you end up with. Now, what you end up with uh, is calculated th through what I described. I don't have to do anything there okay. in what I described. Uh, I actually... Uh, uh, but, but at the end, uh, I, when I interpret my results, I will do what you're suggesting. Okay. I don't have to do that from the beginning. I do it from the beginning when I uh, do uh, theoretically because, uh, uh, um, well, it, it depends what uh, my goal is. Okay, I mean, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, Okay, and the second question is concerns scalar electrodynamics that uh, example mm -hmm. showed us. Do you still have to keep a periodic boundary conditions for the fields in that calculation? Well, I mean, it's a scalar, so what what do you you want anti periodic? Uh, what I'm worried about is the following. I mean, if you try to implement the Gauss law on a compact manifold you usually end up with confinement because uh, Gauss law means essentially that the flux lines extend to infinity. And here you, you have two charges on a torus, one positive charge, one negative yeah. charge. And then this means that you will have confinement because the flux lines have nowhere to go, just uh, extending on the torus. And which means that your Hilbert space will be no longer composed of the five fields, but of composites. Um, These are the so-called- no, Are, are you saying that the, uh, the continuous- The, the In continuum the continuum limit- cannot implement Gauss law on a compact manifold because this means confinement. Because the flux lines. So you're, you're not going to get the right uh, continuum yes. limit, you're saying? Yes. Okay, I have to think about it. Uh, Gauss law in, on, an, on a normal space means that the flux lines from a charge will go to infinity. Yeah, yeah, but uh, okay. But if you have a compact manifold, they have to cannot go to infinity, so they have to end up on negative charge. That's mean that means that you have confinement. So your Hilbert space is no longer composed of the phi fields, but on phi dagger phi, let's say something like that. I don't think so, but uh, I, I cannot uh, argue with you. Oh. Uh, okay. 
I mean, uh, how would you implement the Gauss's law in that case? Uh, I mean, what, what would the, uh, what kind of formulation would give you the right uh, continuum limit? The continuum limit means that uh, your theory is confining. You don't have a, you don't have in an out, out stage composed of. Uh, no, but let, let's say I want to describe my infinite, uh, uh, my infinite QED. And uh, I cut the space, I put it in a box and impose periodic boundary condition. Are you saying that, you that have, uh, I'm, I'm no longer? Sorry? You have a torus. Periodic boundary conditions means that you have, you have to implement QED on a torus. But then I take the limit as L goes to infinity. And, and you're saying I'm not going to get my. Uh... I don't know that. I don't know really. I mean, that, that, that sounds weird because uh, any system, uh, I mean, if you want the, uh, the definition of, of an infinite system, it has to be, uh, you take the finite system and, and then you uh, uh, let uh, the size uh, go to infinity. Otherwise, how are you going to define? I don't know, uh, unless the- yeah, This certainly happens when you have gauge fields because you have uh, all the configurations that wrap uh, uh, of the gauge field that wrap around the torus. This, this is Hoft stuff. I mean, Toronic Vika, as they used to call. Uh, these, these are the large gauge. Uh, large gauge. There are large gauge. Yeah. Large gauge transformations. Right. I mean, you have large gauge transformations, of course, because it's a torus. But I, I don't think that that. Uh, I mean, so you have extra degrees of freedom, but I don't think yes, you have. You have a yeah. You have a, a, a transformation of your theory. In yeah, the, but those are extra the, degrees of freedom. But I mean, I don't think you have confinement if it is a billion. But uh, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, that, that's also. Well, if it's done a billion, I don't know. Do you know Tasso? Um, non a billion. Uh, well, it's. Uh, it's confined, uh, people think so, but for the abelian case, uh, how do you how do you prove confinement? Uh, you have to... It's just uh, a, simple, a simple, you know, application of Gauss's law because you don't have, uh, the flux lines have to end somewhere, end somewhere or go to infinity. So they can- Yeah, but I mean, or they go around the torus. No, because they, oh, have, yes, they are. Uh, they have to end so up on a case transformation. If you have two positive and negative charges, you can easily implement Gauss's law by assuming that the flux lines end up on an opposite charge, which means essentially that you have confinement. You don't have. No, they don't have to end up. I mean, they can go around the torus. But in order to prove confinement, you need. Uh, need to show a linear potential. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, just because they end up at uh, two charges, it doesn't mean that, I mean, you, you don't know the, uh, uh, if you have Coulomb's law, I mean, you have Coulomb's law, why wouldn't you have Coulomb's law? They can wrap around the torus, but they, have, they cannot end up on the same charge because they have to end up somewhere. Anyway, we have to. Uh, I don't think that's uh, that's. Uh, well, I, I have to think about how to uh, argue about this. Okay, that's not important for the case, I think. But uh, I, I, I don't think so. But I mean, I'll think about it. <laughs> okay. Have, okay. Then more I have, questions. I have one a question again. Uh, maybe a last one. Um, okay. Uh, I understand that uh, it is important to implement this non-Gaussian kind of interaction. So um, this, re uh, this reminds uh, the situations in field theory uh, where, okay, you have a non-quadratic uh, Lagrangian, so equations of motions, and you cannot solve them and you do a kind of perturbation theory. But what if you, if you have a system 
that it is actually integrable, but nevertheless non non Gaussian. That, for example, you can solve explicitly some uh, systems with phi to the fourth or phi cube. Has anybody thought of uh, doing a quantum mechanics? I'm sure. Yeah. Mechanics so, so you're saying maybe there's a transformation that takes you to uh, uh, a similar description. Yes. Uh, no, I, I haven't seen anything. Uh, that is. Yeah, that, that, that would be interesting to uh, if, if you can. Uh, I mean, you have to create uh, that system experimentally, right? Oh yes, sure, yes. Yeah, but, but, but so okay. and then the question is uh, whether you can map uh, this problem to uh, uh, something that's uh, integrable. Uh, that would be an interesting uh, thing to explore. Yeah, but the system will will anyway be finite. I mean, you, you will discretize it, but in practice, you have to end that discretization somewhere. So you want, most probably you won't be able to see anything. Well, no, I mean, uh, he's saying that if I have, a, I don't know, maybe you're thinking a sine Gordon system or something. Yeah. 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 So if you can, uh, if you can map uh, the, the system to sine Gordon, then, uh, then you have a different way of implementing uh, this additional gate. You only need one gate. Yes, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't I know. Really thought about that. This is uh, very interesting. Okay, so. Okay, then further questions yeah. from the audience. Yeah, I would have one the first time. Sorry? Yeah, I, I would have one the first time. Yes, uh, I guess so. Yeah. So I mean, the usual recipe in quantum computation is that I can assign some kind of identity to a state and I can track that identity um, no matter how my system changes. Um, so a lot of the time we are worried about uh, leakage uh, of our system outside the computational space. And here, if I understood that correctly, and it's the first time I'm hearing about this Q mode story, so excuse my ignorance, uh, but it feels like here you have a continuous spectrum. Yes. So, so in such a case, is, is what I'm thinking about something completely irrelevant, or do you expect that you can somehow deal with this situation in this continuous spectrum case? So when you say the identity, you, you mean uh, you, you apply something and you track it so that you can see the errors yeah, that, 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 that come, come in. So here, uh, I don't know if there's something uh, equivalent uh, because the identity would involve an infinite number of modes. Uh, I mean, an infinite number of states, right? Because it's an infinite dimensional space. So I don't know if uh, uh, it's useful to do that because uh, okay, uh, or I, I don't know if people have done this, because, uh, mainly because it involves an infinite number of states and uh, experimentally, uh, how do you do that? Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I, I don't think it's a useful way of uh, uh, pinpointing the errors in this case. I mean, it is useful in the case of qubits, but it may not be so useful in this case. The only thing I can think of is uh, if you restrict your Hebrew space to two states, then you can do what you said. Because it will only, it's only going to involve those two states, and those two states may uh, leak or may change, uh, and uh, but they may change in a controllable way, so that uh, uh, because if they go to a neighboring state, the neighboring state is not part of this Hilbert space, so it's easy for you to to bring it back, uh, or you, you can track the uh, uh, the identity 
that involves only those two states. Yeah, exactly. So you can kind yeah. of track if, if something went wrong, you can track it more reliably. Yeah, yeah. So, so in that case, uh, it may be possible. Problems, um, how do you track problems in this case then? In your uh, two modes situation? How do you track that? Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how to actually uh, control uh, okay. uh, everything. And, and that's one of the main problems that, uh, that uh, this kind of system faces. Uh, it's not uh, as simple as in the qubit case where you only have two states. I mean, that's also not true necessarily, right? I mean, most of the qubit platforms today don't are not two level systems anyways. What are they? From, uh, I mean, they, we treat them like they are two level systems, but they're not, so it's- Oh, you mean uh, the underlying physical system is not- traps, yeah, Of course, of course, traps, they're not- Interacting qubits, none of them are right. also infinite dimensional qubits. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> but the, the difference I think is that it's a discretized spectrum. Yeah, yeah. So in this case, yeah, it makes kind of sense to think of leakage that way, but yeah, here yeah, one would have to do it completely different, I imagine. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering whether you had some input. Yeah, I don't have a, okay. yeah, I don't know how to do that. No, thanks for the talk again. Okay, more questions. Mm -hmm. No, uh, may, May I ask one small one? I hope it has a small answer, but uh, if it is okay, I could ask, for example, you saw this gate symmetry and how to implement this uh, in, for QED, I guess there is a U1 gate symmetry, and you have also this constraint, extra constraint in your state, so they have to be gates invariant. Uh, I wanted to ask how easy it is to implement this and what happens also if you have other gates is symmetries like SU2 or SU3 or yeah. even SUN. So in this case, uh, it was uh, not simple, but it, it was doable uh, and you could implement Gauss's law, but in, in a more, in a non-abelian case, it's not simple at all. And uh, I, 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 have, I, I don't know how to implement it. <laughs> yeah, I, and people have been trying uh, for a long time to uh, to figure out how to do non-abelian gauge theories. There are some uh, simple uh, suggestions uh, for I mean for simple system, not simple suggestions. Uh, suggestions for simple systems uh, where they, uh, they they bring the uh, the gauge symmetry down to something manageable. But uh, for a realistic system where uh, SQ2, for example, uh, I don't think anybody has any idea how to. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but it, it would be very important to be able to do that, right? Yeah, indeed. Oh, well, yes, thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay, if there are no more questions, let us thank our speaker again for this very nice talk. Thank you very much, Yorgo. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. Uh,